Hi, welcome to BAFTA and this special session on production design where we have all our nominees for production design for the BAFTAs here with us. My name's Hannah Patterson. First of all, we're going to show a, sh a clip reel from Three Mills who have very kindly supported this session and then I will bring all the nominees onto the stage. Thank you. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, first of all, Alice Felton and Fiona Crombie for The Favourite. <laughs> Barbara Enriquez and Eugenio Caballero for Roma. <laughs> Nathan Crowley and Kathy Lucas for First Man. And then John Meyer and Gordon Sim for Mary Poppins Returns. <laughs> you all got room there? Ooh. Yes. I could always sit on the You okay? No, I'm fine. Um, right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a chat amongst ourselves for about 45 minutes and we're going to show some clips and then we will put um, it out for uh, questions from the audience. So, first of all, it'd be great to start with the favourite, please. And I'd be really interested to know how you went about creating the early 1700s, uh, well, on this budget, the, the, the budget that you were working with, but also imbuing it with such a kind of contemporary feeling. Oh, well, it starts with reference. I mean, it starts with what's on the page, really. You know, and I, there were so many clues in the script. Immediately, we knew that there were you know, many things, whether it was, you know, the way that they, they were phrasing the language to actual, you know, descriptive props. We just knew they didn't exist. So that kind of meant that from the get-go, we just had to... We knew that we had to invent a world that sort of walked a very particular line between giving a real sense of time and history, but equally, it was playful and invented, and it was never... I mean, also, knowing Yorgos's work, I mean, his work is always kind of its own capsule universe, you know, they, he creates a, a particular world within his films, and this is no different. It's, I mean, it's less brutal than some of his, you know, but it, nevertheless, it's completely, it's a construct, and so we had to work out how to, yeah, walk that line. We didn't want to be tongue-in-cheek, we didn't want to be fantasy with it, we just wanted to kind of, I don't know, chart a particular path. Yeah. We tend to, we tend to work and every film we work on together, we make a set of rules for ourselves. So we did the same in The Favourite because we were historically accurate at some points, but the script wasn't, and it was so wicked and dark and funny already. We just wanted to keep playing with that and playing, so we had so much fun doing it because we were like, oh, maybe the rabbits would have their own yeah. table full of tiny pots of silverware with brass and scissors and they had their own brush to clean them so if you keep 17 rabbits in your room how do you keep them how do you so these are all the questions yeah. we ask each other every day and then we just become more excited about them. and we did that with everything like food and flowers and fabric what i particularly enjoyed about it is how it has a, although there's a lavishness to it it has a very spare mm. feel and there's a lot of space yeah, in yeah. the film and in those, in those rooms that they spend yeah. all their time in. Mm. Very interested to know how you managed to kind of create that. Do you know, it was an, a very, I mean, it was an early impulse. So when I met Yorgos and I presented, you know, my, da da, here's my vision, you know, please employ me. They were, that was my referencing, you know, very big, empty, architecturally extraordinary. But what was interesting for me as well was not only the sense of emptiness and space, but also a play on scale. I loved the idea that the humans would be outsized, you know, but also that objects could be, could throw scale. So like her enormous bed was, you know, that was great, like next to a tiny chair. So this kind of, I mean, it's actually quite accurate for the period. I remember looking, going to the V&A and seeing sort of things like table settings with enormous forks next to tiny spoons. It's like they hadn't worked out, <laughs> which way should we go? Should we make it massive or tiny? You know, they sort of hadn't worked it out. And I really loved that there was a sort of tension between that. And then in terms of the, you know, so the emptiness was just an impulse. Um, and your cost. His yeah. biggest dressing note for, you know, set decoration was give me space. Yeah. Because he wanted them to dance and move and, yeah. and it was 360. Every, yeah. every set was 360. So we... He would say corridors. Yeah. Give me corridors. So the way that we would lay out the rooms was to, knowing that Robbie would need to be, 
you know, really yeah. mobile. So it all sort of played, it kind of just came together because yeah. it was the impulse initially and then that, so I think he sort of thought, oh great, now I don't have to explain that to you because you already worked it out, you know, and, and so it all kind of came together, yeah. So tell us a bit more about that specific, the location, the house that you were working in. Well, we, we were just talking about this. So Hatfield, we were very blessed that we were there so much at prep and kind of that we ended up having construction building there. We built our carriages there. We had rooms full of flowers. So we almost could walk around. We could be dressing and then we could pop in and check things. And we had such a good relationship with the people there that as we went, they trusted us more and more. And then, I mean, we wanted to strip that room out. That room is full to the gills of painting and they did not want us to initially and then we worked between us and then so each you know yeah we were we were really blessed working there and having really good relationships was it a listed building I mean, were there things oh, yeah. that you, you just yeah. can't change presumably or were, could, you, could you dress everything yeah we could dress everything and we built in almost every room so they allowed us but it's very you know i mean there are people watching the whole time it's very controlled um, understandably. And so it just means that it meant that we had to be very organised. You know, so there was no sort of, oh, on a whim, let's, you know, build something over there. You can't do that. You have to have the plans and you have to have made requests. And so there's lots of things like that that, I mean, to be honest, it wasn't a problem because we were organised. And But I felt like I, I was able to walk around that building and take so many cues from it that then we brought into our construction I mean, we were bending and warping panels so that it all felt like it was, had been there as long as the house, you know. So, I, I mean, I really enjoyed kind of bringing my world and, you know, pulling it all together. But, um, yeah, it just meant that you couldn't... Yeah, that it was just very, very controlled. But it doesn't feel like it was a restrictive thing. It no. feels to me like it was actually... It really kind of helped no, it, your process. No, I loved it. I yeah, actually yeah. loved working there. I, re I mean, I think I just like that anyway. I really like finding a way to use a location and then you grow it. And, and also because, you know, our story couldn't be told in Hatfield House as, it's, as it runs. So finding clever ways to manipulate it, you know, um, I think we got lots of added benefits. I mean, I love yeah. all the scars on the floors and, you know, all the things that tell you that this is a, a living place. There's a humanity to that space that I loved, you know, yeah. And um, just before we move on, I'm just also interested to talk a bit about palette, mm. the kind of colour palette of it, because it... it uh, with Sandy Powell's costumes and how much you sort of talked about how those costumes were going to read into the, the sort of the palette that you were working mm. with in terms of the design. Well, it was a, that was a bit of a wrestle. We had to really work out which approach to take with palette, um, knowing that Sandy was going to be, you know, pretty much monochromatic. And so we basically, you know, it kept coming... For us, it kept coming back to simplicity, which might seem disingenuous because it's very lavish environment but actually there's a it's really stripped out you know that we only used gold fabric the whole way through the film um you know in the same way that we only used wooden furniture or marble inlay we you know like Alice yeah. said we only have like all the china is blue and white we just kind of went if we just stick with the same sort of tones and motifs I, I it will just it means it's not overwhelming it also gave us a set of yeah you know, a little path to follow, like, oh, we won't choose anything except blue and white china, there's no conversation, you know, we just kept, yeah. And also what's wonderful with this film in particular, because it does have such a, it's a period film, it has such a yeah. contemporary feeling, particularly in terms of its themes. Yeah. It really feels like that serves the story. Yeah, absolutely. So you're not looking at these characters who are sort of too adorned. Yes, yeah. exactly. You're really yeah. getting to the heart of yeah. them. Yeah. We yeah. wanted our gold to be a neutral backing to these mm. extraordinary costumes. Mm. So yeah. we didn't want to have all these colours mm -hmm. fighting with the black and white. So then you can explore gold and then gold becomes a journey. Yeah. The gold is, you know, different golds and textures in gold and every gold fabric and the different silks. So yeah, that was really nice. It means you can go deeper into something, mm. which was really nice. Cool. Let's move on to talking about Roma, <laughs> which, um, not, I mean, again, a lot of it set in one location, the house, but then a lot of it also set very much on the move and in a city and in a city that you had to kind of recreate, Mexico City in, in the 1970s. What were the challenges that you kind of, what were your initial challenges with, with those locations? Well, they, the, I think that, um, I mean, there were several challenges. One, that the city had changed a lot, you know, like really massively. We had a, 
a big earthquake in that really hits that neighborhood or that area of the city that completely changed the face of, a, of, of, of the neighborhood. Um, that was one, one, massive, one of the biggest uh, challenges. The other is that we were recreating the memories of the director. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and then the method that he chose um, that he cho have chosen to, to, um, to approach to this film, which was not to share the script. No, like a, we, <laughs> no, like a, <laughs> basically. So we, with anybody. With anybody. I read the script <laughs> once the big sets were all, you know, basically done. Uh, so, so how would this work? Basically, he said that he didn't want um, us to, let's say, take decisions based on the story, or not, let's say the actions that the characters will have, but he wanted to talk about subjects like a socio-political context, or, you know, or let's say the, 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 the destruction of a family, you know, or the moment where the family changes, or where, you know, the, the, in this case, the, the family as the kids know, they, they, they split. So, you know, these, these subjects are the ones that he really wanted to point out. So we talked a lot about that. Then we had long conversations with him basically saying, okay, which, let's, let's try to make a set list. Okay, we'll do a set list. So how are we gonna do these sets? What do, do you want, you know, how long, how big, how wide? And he tried to explain it, but it was always Back in a certain way, you know, like uh, <laughs> so we had to be prepared for everything. Like no, he he would make a little drawing, uh, but uh, my lamp. Yes, my this lamp. is this is my lamp, and then okay, what's that? So at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, uh, Barbara has done an amazing period research. So so this this will be basically sit sit on the table for hours and hours, or walking through the city. Um, looking for locations or, or visiting the places where the real events took place. Um, he always said that he wanted to honor time and space. So, and, um, so, so we went to the, to the real places where the story, where the events took place. So it was great to walk in the streets because then we would be talking about, you know, whatever, the, like the buildings that were collapsed and that we had to recreate digitally or something mm -hmm. like that, and he will just stop and say, "Yes, that that's the tile that I remember." <laughs> like, like, so it was uh, that connects us to uh, our own memories, and it was very interesting because at the end uh, we end up doing a very uh, very different approach and a very different research too. You know, like um, because it was a Barbara did a huge as I said, historical research, we, I did myself. But then we went to the memories of, you know, we talked with our parents, because it's, it basically it's their time in mm. a certain way, you know? So mm. we talked a lot, there. we went to the family photos to there, and then, and look to those photos that are never published because they are not iconic or interest, but in those ones you find a lot of details mm -hmm. that are great. Those silly things that you say, well, I never will pub publish this or put <laughs> upload it in the internet. Those were great in order to, to have, um, you know, the, the, the details. Uh, so that was probably the most difficult thing. Then um, that forced us to take some big decisions like building the big avenues, for example. Mm. But um, Barbara was saying yesterday, no, like, uh, uh, he tricked us sometimes, like saying, I don't know if we're gonna go to, if probably I will do some coverage in the interior of the business. Like all the business that right. were in the streets, for example. Oh. So we dressed everything in order to have oh, that kind of thing. And then it's a panning outside. I, I feel, I, maybe, maybe just because I wanna feel my, you know, feel good for my team that, that, ref that is reflected on the screen, mm -hmm. you know, and those little details at the end end up in, uh, in, in the screen somehow. Well, but through, the actors, yeah. oh, through the actors, yeah, but, through the yeah, actions, yeah. you know. But, um, but uh, you know, everything was like, the, the, for example, Barbara and his team, not just dressing, but all the graphic design that is behind, you know, some of these period mm -hmm. pieces uh, were, Extraordinary, no? Uh, okay, so newspapers, that. magazines, everything. Okay. And any 
a difference to what you did because you knew it was going to be shot in black and white? Sorry? Because it was going to be shot in black and white. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. How did I that mean, affect? It was, it, it, I mean, the first thing that when I get the first, com the first call from Alfonso, he said, well, I want to do this film in Mexico. No, it would be great if we can do it together. And I said, well, can you send me the script? He said, I'm going to send you the script. And, <laughs> uh, and it's black and white, and we're going to shot in chronological order. That means that, mm. you know, the way it's... Because he didn't want to reveal the actions to the actors. The, the actors will never know what, would they, what would the character will, you know, uh, develop or um, it will continue, mm -hmm. which are the actions and how that arc of uh, uh, arch of, uh, of, um, of, of performance or uh, of character will, will, will end up. Uh, he, he said, well, we need, to, we, we need to be in a strict continuity. So that means that the house, as, you, as you've seen, um, has to be up and running for yeah. six wow. months yeah. or something like that. We shot for 19 weeks. Mm. Um, and uh, so the first scene is in the house, the last scene is in the house. Mm. So that means that that house had to be there, you know, like really working because it was like a machine for mm. uh, not just the house, it was a set. So it had a lot of, um, you know, uh, movable walls and, and mm. things and like that. And the black and white <laughs> thing. Uh, so <laughs> so he, also we, we talked about not having... Um, Kind of a nostalgic black and white. We didn't want to really go to the to this, you know, huge contrast. We wanted to have a very controlled um, grayscale, mm -hmm. no. And in so what we did is we created a palette um, that we will always translate the colors and and um, and know which is the amount of contrast we want to have in between the main things on the on on the frame. Um, so that was always a guide for us. Uh, sometimes those colors were absurd, like in real in real life. Some no, like I remember the the, the sofa in the in, in the house, which was crazy pink, you know. Like mm. uh, and uh, but we found a lot of uh, you know we we knew that uh, we wanted to be to be that kind of gray. We we looked for the fabric that was the correct for that, and it resulted to be pink. So it was crazy. It was a little crazy up there on the on the custom on the on the um, on the clothes. Also, we on the clothes we had the same. You know, like a, sometimes there was a strange color, or, uh, but um, but it worked very well in, bla in black and white. Mm -hmm. So, what were the kind of discussions you had around setting that scene up? Well, first of all, um, you know, we did it in a location. We wanted which this is a modified location. I would say in an eighty percent. So every, every material that you see there, uh, it's basically, uh, we put it. We put it uh, first of all, we said that we talked about the textures of the tiles. So that, uh, those tiles that actually is the starting point of the film, like mm. um, we wanted to, there were, there, uh, th those, those came from the original uh, house of Alfonso that we couldn't shoot at but for, because of different reasons. One is that the, the house had been, has been modified many times. Then it was smaller than this house, so it was uh, not comfortable to shoot. But anyway, it was impossible to shoot in the other house. So we decided to find a house uh, that, we could, that we could um, really modify. So we found this house that was slated to be demolished. Now it's 12 apartments. You know, like, uh, so, so we just hold the demolition and get inside transform it, you know, we reinforce the structure with engineers and really transform it in a big percentage. Um, um, so, so those tiles, we, we needed to be real tiles because we will shoot for a long period of time, but those tiles are not existing no more. So we just went to found, find a retired artisan that he did the tiles in the same fashion that they were done, mm. you know. The house, the original house was built on the 30s, so, so this guy, you know, he was 80 years old, and he did these <laughs> tiles for us. It took three times the time that he said that he would do. So we were just crazy. Luckily, we, we the film got pushed a little bit, so we, we we were on time. Then, obviously, the measurements of the car and the garage. We wanted to be 
because as you see it in the film, it, it, is, it was in real life, you know, like we had a, just a millimetric uh, approach. And also there was um, the, the first scene of the film also that happens in that same location. There's water running into, the, into a, a drain. So we had to, you know, kind of understand what was the inclination mm. uh, of, uh, of the drain that we needed for the shoot. We worked with the special effects in order to do that. So it was a, it was a fun thing to make. Um, we decided to go to a, locations and, and, uh, to a location and not to a studio because we had a lot of non-professional actors. No, mo mo most of them, except one, except Marina, uh, is the first time that they had been on a set. So even if the set had those tricks, like we created slots on the roof, um, so we can basically have guillotine walls, mm -hmm. uh, so we can light and put the camera the way we want it through the through the roof. It will we reinforce mm -hmm. the structure, cut slot, and but most of the materials were real, you know, so. We want to plaster real tiles, brick, in order for them to feel that they were basically in a, in, in, in a house. Yeah. And we did the same with the set decoration, no, Barbara, in los cajones, no? So, <coughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, Barbara and her team, they just dressed up all the, because we didn't know how it would be covered. Mm. We had certain ideas of the long, um, takes that will have established the thing, but we never uh, uh, we, ne we never knew if Alfonso would go and do more coverage okay. and on the mm. different. So everything was fully dressed. All the all the uh, all the, the inside of the drawers, uh, everything mm. was with everything. very personal details that will define. Mm -hmm. Also, Alfonso, in a certain moment, he would say, he said, "I will try to get the actors by themselves in the house." and ask them to dress with the clothes of that. Then that idea transformed, you know, but the, at the beginning was, was, okay, let's try to not have even makeup or, or somebody of the, of, of the, wow. of the custom, uh, uh, you know, of the, uh, yes, of, of, the, of the custom department or wardrobe department. And uh, let's put them there and they would pick up the clothes and things. So that was part of the experiment. It was a very experimental film. That, that's what I, that's, yeah. that, that, was, that was a big learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so First Man, mm -hmm. again, period, a very yes. famous yes. period of history right. in this, a very specific event, lead, the lead up to, you know, the, the moon landing with Neil, Neil Armstrong. Um, and this is a film which manages to portray it in a way that we've just not seen before and, and has an atmosphere that no other film like this has had before, I, I thought, personally, watching it. Um, right. So it'd be great if you could talk a bit about the kind of discussions you had um, with Damien Chazelle around that and how you, how you were going to sort of create mm -hmm. that t tone. Yeah, I guess um, Damien came to me kind of at the last minute, just before he launched into that film, and we sort of met. He was on the La La Land tour and we met in uh, the Carlisle in the piano bar, which was top notch. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he Good said, I need, well, it was important because you kind of like, you have to connect with the director. Yeah. So it's so important. And so he said, I, you know, I, I want to make this film. I want to, you know, I want to, I want to go into space. I want the audience to feel it. I want the dangers of what these people went through, what NASA went through, the changing times. And he said, I want to do it in camera. And so he said, you know, like he came to me because, because they, I know I get asked to do tricky films. So <laughs> he, um, so we, we talked early on that he really, really wanted to feel the journey. And um, so really it was about, apart from the design, the period, it was really two films. It's Kathy's brilliant interiors and the romanticism of El Lago and where they lived with the sort of the danger at the incredible danger of what they were doing. So to get them into that danger, really Kathy had to deal with the neighborhoods and I, and it was about methodology. Okay. So we had to, to do it in camera, to do it in three film formats. So you build from the romanticism of Super 16 to two per 35 as the, the show goes on to 35 to IMAX. So you have to, and so everything had to be practical. So really, it was a, it was a, for me, it was about uh, intense methodology and capturing 
that feeling. So we, we, you know, we ended up in the art department, you know, deciding to break it down into, you know, interior cockpits, exterior camera mounts. So the thing about NASA when you go and spend some time in Houston and you look at all the footage is we know because we've seen hundreds of these films and minutes of these great journeys, the camera's always fixed to the ship. So you, to get the people there, you have to fix exterior cameras. So it's really hard to explain quickly, but so it's, um, it's about exterior craft mount, and we use LED technology with play great visual effects, adapted uh, you know, orbit, Earth orbit and lunar orbit. So we could capture it all in camera with those finishes, and then we had to pull inside those craft, build them full, real size, which was a problem, to get those actors in, so they would feel quite awkward. Um, and we really had to sort of, I mean, we over, I mean, I overaged those every cockpit, because I, I really wanted to make you feel that they didn't belong in space. It was a tin can, it was, they were testing every mission, they tested something new. Like Gemini, there's so many Gemini missions. So how do you, how do you, you know, they would go and test like, you know, docking, uh, spacewalking. So every mission there was intense first time danger. So it was about putting the actors in there uh, and then really working backwards. So mid ground was always miniatures and. You know, I've done a lot of miniatures. We decided that we'd just build them in the art department because, you know, as usual, producers, they don't want to pay for them, so we just built them ourselves. Um, I mean, that's just the truth. They look at me like I'm out of my mind. Um, but we've been doing it 100 years, FYI. Uh, so we built them ourselves. In fact, day one in the art department, we started building the Saturn V. So then, you know, you, you kind of have to build down to... How do you dock them? So it was, you know, we sort of thought, well, okay, we're going to dock them. We're going to build these things full size because we need them everywhere. Then we're going to dock them on tracks, and so we can, you know, we, you know, when you look at some of that footage, we know if we craft mount, like when you, when you, when you dock into the Agena on the Gemini, you can, you, you know, that footage. You're moving around, so we can put you on a gimbal and have Agena come in. So, but these things are tiny, so we can just build them full size and just put them together. Like nothing original about that. I mean, should we have a look at the clip? Maybe yeah, we so we I mean, even get to El Largo, which is Kathy's oh, we, oh, world. No, oh, yeah, no, yeah. Should we do that? Well, no, we do that before the clip. We'll do that before the clip. Like all the Tell interiors, us, Kathy yeah. was... I mean, that's extraordinary. It feels like a, a whole other place. Well, it exists, it, it, hermetically sealed. <laughs> I was really lucky because, you know, all the major uh, magazines, Look, Life, Time, they all yeah. were there in the homes with the astronauts' wives shooting all of this while they were up in space. So I had reference, real reference. And I also, we also had access to the Armstrong boys who are now in their 60s. But, so I would call them up and say, well, what was in your room? You know, what did you like? And it was like, oh, I loved peanuts. You know, it was, it was like things that you would never know that someone would really like mm -hmm. or, or identify with. Um, so I had them as well as all the photos. Um, and then knowing that astronauts don't make a lot of money, so you didn't have to go to the high end. It was just a s simpler time, so it was simple mm. dressing. Yeah. And you really noticed the fact that they don't have a lot of things, mm. unnecessary things. Right, because they yeah. didn't have the money. They yeah. weren't paid anything. Yeah. But you also, tonally, it was about like putting the danger. So you'd like Neil before he went to space, mm. but we, we used darker tones. Kathy found darker materials, so you really, the contrast, those interiors are about contrast yeah. and darkness and, you know, the darkness, the, the darkness of going off, and you don't, you're not going to work, no. you're going into space, <laughs> you know, he's sitting there with his shirt and tying his suitcase, and it was about making it, so Kathy's materials were fantastic, it was like, how do you get dark enough to force when you light him, you do, he goes into black. And, and it you know, feels, what does that I mean, it absolutely feels like he's not, it, he doesn't have a proper place anywhere. No. In a way, that he's always out of, a, he's always out of his comfort zone. So how did you do that? Grease on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, that's what, you know, weird, weirdly, when you take on these films, I was believing, just ignoring the most difficult thing. So you, because you have to find it and feel it. So that, ended up, it's just one of those 
crazy conversations with the location. We're in Atlanta, Georgia, which is the greenest place with giant trees. And I just, you know, you go into locations, you will go, go hey, and do you have a gray quarry that's endless for miles by, by chance? And he, he looked, he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was, so we found a gray quarry, which, um, which was just, you know, and because we were in Georgia, those people are, are just lovely and helpful. So it was like, any chance you can pick me a bowl, five acre bowl with your big machines. And so really it became about, we knew we had to be outside and we needed at least five acres and we needed enough, we needed a powerful enough light to make the shadows correct. And there's, you know, there's not mm -hmm. a chance, you can't do this inside. So Kubrick did not fake them. <laughs> Um, and so, really, it was about um, sculpting the landscape. And there's so much documentation about uh, the landing spots. So it was really uh, just sculpting every little crater and rock. And uh, we had to build the lunar module, which kind of had the top session for docking. So we just had to continue that build. And you know, as we come through there, it's in IMAX, and the 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 point of IMAX is every astronaut I spoke to is there because you're trapped in this tin can and you've done all this thing and you've managed to, you know, somehow descend to the moon. Everyone after Neil, I don't know how Neil wasn't around, so we can talk to him, but Al Warden, you know, said all the astronauts were like, it was like a surreal moment. So we chose to put it into IMAX. So when you come through that door, it's, an alien planet, which is what it is. So, um, and yeah, so it was, uh, and Damien, you know, insists that everything is, is, is specific and works. And so it was a lot of, you know, just that, I forget what it's called, just the camera coming down and all that mechanism. It's an enormous amount of research. And NASA were great. And it was great having Apollo 15 astronaut on set with us, Al. Mm -hmm. Because he was, you know, he's in his 90s, and he, I said, hey, is, is that right? He said, I don't know, I can't remember. I was 22. And then we come to Mary Poppins Returns, which has a very specific, I mean, obviously you're working with something that people have an affection for, uh, the original film, so that you've got, you're working with people's memories of that film, but wanting to... Um, create something new and, and deciding to set it in the 1930s London as opposed to the, the original, mm -hmm. which was Edwardian London, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what kinds of discussions did you have around how to kind of create this world where, it, you know, there was a depression going on, essentially, and then you have this amazing character who comes in and brings her own sort of vibrancy to this place? Well, the first meeting we had with Rob Marshall, the director, he said, we're not remaking Mary Poppins. We're making our own movie. And it was Rob who came up with this lovely idea to set it 25 years later. So the two little children have grown up, and Michael has kids of his own. And it was also lovely for us because the world they come into is so completely different. So the house was an interesting thing because we, it's the same house, but we, we didn't feel compelled to literally recreate it. And we wanted to tell a very different story. And the first Mary Poppins, at least at the beginning, the father was terrible. The father didn't really care about the kids. Everything was very prim and proper. The house was not a place that children or anyone would really like to live in. We, we looked at the movie a little bit, yeah, not too much. Just a little bit. But we noticed like right away there isn't even a, 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 a couch in the living room. Mm -hmm. It was not really a place for it people really to live. It was a family home. Mm -hmm. But our character of Michael growing up was completely different. It, 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 it was a home for the family, and in fact, the children were literally running the home. And so we were able to get much more colorful, much more textured. We also wanted to make the house a little more accessible, so we brought it down in scale. Um, wanted to make it look a little bit less like this beautiful white mansion. Uh, we made it a, a, a shorter, it's not quite as tall. Uh, we left brick exposed on the exterior of the house, also again, just to make it feel a little more accessible. And dealing with location shooting in London, quite specific locations. We did. We built an awful lot, including a lot of the streets. Um, it was interesting talking to people who've seen the film and how many streets we shot. A lot of this goes to our director of photography, Dion Beebe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
he, we built streets inside of Shepherd and Studios, and you cannot tell. And, and we had a little bit to do with that, but I really give the major. Yeah, it, we go back and forth between set and location. The and opening and of the film is constantly going from a famous London landmark like the Tower of London to a street at Shepperton to another famous landmark, St. Paul's, mm -hmm. to something else we created at Shepperton. And um, we had to think it all through. And also, luckily, well, we were just blessed to work with a great, a great team. I had the best art department I've ever had in my life here in London. And the director and the DP are all people we've worked with for a while. And the director, Rob Marshall, is so schooled, he can, he can, I'm sorry to say this in front of you, Eugenio, we would go to a location and say, I'm going to start here, and we'll end here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're never looking that way. And we would rehearse. We would actually bring bicycles out, and we'd ride through. And uh, when we, we would be able to know what the piece of the location was, the texture of the streets, the texture of the walls, the quality of the poles, uh, and then know that we were coming in immediately to our own set, and we were able to match that. Mm. So we were able to match the textures, the colors, the, the broken nature of the street, and then Dion Beebe was able to match beautifully the lighting. Mm. Um, I'm interested, we'll, we'll have a look at your clip, which is the Topsy House right. clip. Um, but about the, the kind of importance of objects in this film, because because of what Mary Poppins imbues objects with, and they always have a different meaning than people think they have, and just sort of how you, how you dealt with that. Well, there's so many iconic objects having to do with Mary Poppins. And again, we are given a brief that, that we didn't have to recreate what was there. And in fact, our film, we wanted it to be, the term we used was dipped in reality. So a good example is Mary Poppins' umbrella, which in the first film, it's very broad. It's almost a cartoon yeah, head. And we immediately said, well, no, we don't want to do that. We, we thought, wouldn't it be fun if we could create something that looks absolutely like a real umbrella, that if you walked into an antique store, and even if you weren't looking for a parrot head umbrella, you had to have it, because it was so fantastic. So ours is wood, but it's also has, uh, uh, it has inlays of, of, of ivory. There's some jewels, some metal inlaid into it. So it, it looks real, but it still had a magical quality to it. And we were working with children a lot in our film. And we, we, we wanted to use as little green screen and visual effects as possible, particularly around the children. So uh, we, we created, uh, Steve Warner, our special effects technician, created the umbrella that you could just hand hold. There were no cables attached to it. But it was all auto animatronic. So that little parrot head could wink, it could talk, it could turn its head, it could smile. And we had a puppeteer who worked it remotely. It was all battery operated. Mm. And one of my favorite moments on the film was you know, we, we always have to show all these important things to the director and the cast you know, long before the moment they're going to use them. You can't just show up on the day. You have to make sure everyone's happy. And it unfortunately, because of the intricacy of all of the fittings to make it work, it came in a, a, not late for the shoot date, but it came in like, so we had two weeks before we were going to shoot it. And I chased the director around for two days. Because it's a very hard when you're focused on a scene to some, somebody mm -hmm. come over and start talking to you about something that's going to be weeks later. And I finally was just at a point, I got to let him see it. So I just walked by. We were shooting on 17 Cherry Tree Lane, which was a big set at Shepperton Studios. And I just walked over to him and handed him the cane and walked away. <laughs> and he looked up and said, John, what's this? And the parrot head went, Hello, Rob. How are you doing? <laughs> and he goes, what? He goes, yeah, me. <laughs> and he just lit up. And it was extraordinary, because you could hold this thing. And we had a puppeteer you couldn't see who responded to everything. So he immediately called all the children over. And so we lost about 20 minutes of shooting that day, <laughs> because the whole crew and cast is talking to the parrot and umbrella. But we, we got to do like the carpet bag was something that yeah, Gord that, shopped real carpet for. We were very lucky. I was shopping at Kempton Market, and we walked in at 7 o'clock in the morning. And there's a carpet dealer that's right at the, the opening of that. And I walked in, and there was a small deco carpet lying there, waiting for me to find it. <laughs> and I just knew that was the right carpet. We bought maybe three or four other carpets and took them back to Sandy Powell, our costume designer, and laid them out. I didn't say anything. And her eye immediately went to the same one that I you know, liked so much. And 
within minutes, we knew we had the carpet back. And it was one of the really sort of scary things that we were worried about doing. Re, you know, because the original carpet bag was, well, in our opinion, <laughs> maybe not so attractive. But, um, and we knew we didn't want to do anything like that, so. Um, it had to be that, rather smart. Yeah, it had to be rather smart, rather smart as, as her costumes were. Um, but it got resolved, honestly, in, in a matter of an hour or more. Okay. So both, the, both those props were, were things that we had worried a lot about that came together incredibly easily. So you had to create that absolutely as a, it sounds like an obvious question. Was there, there's, never a que there's never a question that it was going <laughs> to not be a full set built upside down. Yeah. Because again, with the children, we just wanted to have something yeah. th that they could react to. Mm -hmm. So it was literally a 360 set built upside down. We, we built, I had my props team build the set out of rough plywood in the prop room right side up because we didn't, there was no way to dress it upside down. You had to physically understand it right side up. And so we shopped maybe three times as much as what you see on screen because we didn't know what would fit where or how it would fit or what, how we would work it into the, the idea of that set. And um, we, so we built it upside down, we staged things, and then I, I built a scaffold unit and I would go up on the top of that and lie down on my back and put my head <laughs> over and look at the set upside down. But it, it wasn't revolved upside down, it was just merely upside down. So it became a very, very complicated thing for everyone to understand and get their heads around, okay. particularly for the dance choreography, mm -hmm. for Rob, uh, for the cinematographer, Dion, just everybody. Discussing the set took yeah. two weeks for someone to start understanding that up yeah. is down and that the ceiling is down and the floor is up. Or could we just move that a little bit because you were standing in a right side up set. Well, if you did that, then you know Mary Poppins would lose her head. You wouldn't see it. So it had to be very precisely set up. And then we measured everything. We uh, cast and molded everything, hand painted everything, gutted all the furniture. And then it was mounted very specifically in the exact spot it had been on the right side up set. Uh, it was a very long process. Mm. We shopped for three three months just on that set alone to find it. And then for three months after, we molded everything before it got installed. So oh, That's incredible. Mm. Right. Is there, um, are there any questions out there? Yes, somebody here, please. Hello. Hello. Um, so, um, I am filmmaker, um, a young filmmaker who's on 22, uh, I look like 32, but I'm unemployed. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have to clear for something before I ask a question. I don't have heart problem, but my Apple Watch just remind me I have my heart rate just go up quite, quite uh, heavy. And that just show how excited I am to hear, and a good, good luck tomorrow night. Um, so, my question is for Mr. Crowley. Uh, so. I want to ask you something about your, uh, you know, First Man is an event film, you can call it, and you've really just came from another one, which you work with Mr. Nolan on uh, Dunkirk. And in that film, he described um, as an English man, and you have more resonance to it, you know, in terms of that. And I wonder, when you're working on this one, you know, that one perhaps is... Uh, the, the most talk about event in the first half of last century and and this uh, landing on the moon is this, uh, the, this for the second half um, from that background you're not American person and there's a you know that sort of I, thing I'm actually American no, oh, I'm I now know about that. Oh. <laughs> no I guess um, I don't know I don't see it in I mean Dunkirk was it's just if you've grown up I grew up in North London it's just a thing it's just like an event that you, you know there was no we had to make that film. Uh, First Man was really, it's a, it's, it's a world event. I think what's amazing about it is it really was a world event. So I didn't really realize that until we sort of got into it and you start looking at, at the papers and the excitement and it kind of brought the world together for a moment. Um, and I, I found that amazing. But I, I guess as an Englishman in America, I've been there since I was, since actually Thatcher took out England, I left. Um, <laughs> and actually, I started in the American film industry. They gave me my first break. Um, so I'm really grateful. I, I have this sort of great 
love of America, which is hard to say at the moment, um, <laughs> because they're such, they, they, what I love, and I love it through the construction teams, they, and it kind of relates to Neil and NASA, they just get up and do it. And there's no questions, there's no like, oh, should we turn left, should we need a paper form? Do we need? It's like those construction guys, I kind of relate it as like, oh, I would like to be on Omaha Beach with, well, I don't want to be on Omaha Beach, but if I was, I'd want these guys with me. Because they just, it's, it's just a different mentality. They really feel like, we're just going to give it a go. And if it works, it's great. You know, and I, I kind of, that's what I love, this can-do society. Unfortunately, we've ended up worse than the Thatcher years right now, but hopefully, you know, we come through them. But that's really, that's a big thing, this American can-do thing for me. Thank you. Just there, please. Um, hi, um, I was just wondering if any of you specifically studied production design or what sort of avenue path you went through, because I'm an illustrator, but it's something I've always been kind of interested in. So I was wondering, is that helpful for your line of work and what you do now? Anybody can answer oh. that. Yeah. I was a theatre designer, so I studied theatre design and then went I sideways. I started in the theatre as well. Mm. I come from, from art history. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so did Alice. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, I did well. theatre and art, which was art history, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm architecture from Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Brighton too, so that was... <laughs> Probably a little before. I, I was before you, sorry. <laughs> 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 So when I was young, I didn't know if I wanted to be a director or an architect. And um, I, in college, I worked with the Seattle Film Festival. And that was the first time I ever met real directors. And we met this enthusiastic kid who wanted to be an architect or a, a film director. Four like known directors said to me in a week, well, why aren't you a production designer? And it was like you hit me in the face with a fish. I had no idea what a production designer was. <laughs> and these people were saying to me, well, there's somebody who chooses the style of architecture that'll help tell and progress the story, the color palette, the furniture, the car. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> and I, within a week, I quit college, I quit my job, and I drove to Los Angeles, and I pounded on doors for three months until I got a job as an art department PA, which is the lowest level entry position where you, mm -hmm. you get coffee and you make Xeroxes, and I just made myself indispensable. And so people kept hiring me, and I just kind of rose up I don't think, I don't think, there certainly weren't any design courses mm -hmm. when I was at college. It was just, you stum we, I stumbled into it, as did a lot of my generation. I think there are now design courses, but uh, what I like is everyone comes from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. and, because there's no right or wrong in design. No. What about you, Kathy? Well, I studied interior design. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. In Mexico now, still, you cannot find, there's not a school for production yeah. designers. Yeah. You have some courses that you can do, but the, mm -hmm. it's a, Basically, it's passed from generation to, mm -hmm. to generation. You know, you have a mentor, and then you teach, mm -hmm. the, the mentor Your teach you. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, is that a hand there? Yep. There, and then there's one here. Um, there are two of you, obviously, for each film, and it's, I, I guess, that you're production design and art director, maybe, is that right? And I wondered if you could maybe talk about the relationship, how the responsibilities break down between the two roles and how you collaborate. Well, it's really production design. I'm the set decorator. So my job is to deal with the interior furnishings, draperies, sometimes carriages, animals, sometimes. <laughs> Um, and I work in collaboration with John. John and I have worked together for almost, what? Well, we have an unusual 20. relationship. We've worked together so closely that we're a little more of a yeah. team yeah. than but, a lot. But the, the production designer is, is in charge of the overall departments and, and helps kind of organize props and set decorating, construction, paint, plaster, greens. And, and Gord deals with all the furnishings and all the fabrics and all the things that come onto the set. And it sounds like you, you, you were talking about you, you concentrate mainly on exteriors and you're concentrating on the interiors. Is that fair to say? Or there's quite a lot of cross well, on this, as well? Well, this is the first time that we've worked together. Oh, right, okay. So, 
Oh, Kathy. <laughs> well, oh. Uh, Kathy was on Interstellar dealing with weird those things. Books. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was the decorator, but yeah. It, it, this is the first time. I, I think we, we had, it was important to split up. I mean, this was specifically we had to split up because we had such big, as I said earlier, methodology. Mm -hmm. We had to divide yeah. um, because it was about process. And, mm -hmm. you know, d the designer sometimes has to get involved with, pro with process. And, you know, and this is one of those times. Yeah, I mean, at the art department, um, it's, it's really. Um, is the result of a collaboration, you know? And for me, Barbara has been, you know, my, my creative partner, I would say, for many years. Uh, we worked together for, uh, I don't know, like 15. May, maybe 15 <laughs> years or something like that. Uh, then we stopped Barbara, now it's a production designer. Mm -hmm. But she came, basically she decided to come and do set decoration in, in, in the film because it was a different and a special film. Special. But uh, for, for it's been always like, this creative collaboration um, um, in general in, in, in the department and, and in, the, in the department. And uh, with set decoration, I think it's, it's a very nat natural bond for the production designer mm -hmm. to really basically chat and analyze how to approach mm -hmm. to a project. And for you two? Well, we've made four films together now. and. Um, I started working in Australia on tiny little things and we never, I never had a set decorator. I think Alice was my first <laughs> set decorator. So I, I know no other way. Like we just, <laughs> you know, we have this, um, we're very close, you know, yeah, close as, yes, yeah. absolutely. You know, we sort of start things and finish things, you know, like yeah. it's very, yeah, yeah. connected. Mm -hmm. I think we've got time for just one more question that was, Oh, sorry, yes, here. Um, okay, so I just wanted to ask, um, from your first big job, how has your creative approach di like differed or evolved and changed from your last film? So the way that you go about a project, how you uh, want to creatively approach it. Presumably every project is unique, so, yeah. I mean, that's the fun thing about what we do is we get to work on such wildly different projects. And every project, the, the, the creative process and how you approach it is really completely different. Any other comments about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, you're not, <coughs> we're not, you, it, what's great is you're not an act, just because you have all this experience, you have actually no idea how to do the next yeah. one. Mm -hmm. And so it's a journey, it's another journey which keeps you involved. And you, all you learn from your experience is the mistakes. Mm -hmm. You don't learn, necessarily learn how to solve a problem, that's the journey. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what keeps me interested anyway, yeah. so. Yeah, well, that's Same. exactly the, the so. most exciting thing is that you, even, you know, within a project, you don't know how you're gonna solve in a specific mm. set. And you've never uh, quite done the, it before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, and it's, you have to basically try it, you know, like um, have an intuition, follow it, analyze it, you know, probably what you get with experience is a little bit more tools to analyze that thing, but still it's um, a big question mark on how you're gonna end up doing that. And to work with directors who completely understand that process as well and aren't gonna get frustrated by that. Well, mm. <laughs> yes and no, you know, like- Forget that <laughs> question, yeah. <laughs> and for you, in terms of moving on and learning from, you know, your most recent projects. Oh, I mean, I've now sort of identified that I have a process in like I sort of only recently worked out that I actually know how to start, you know, like because I've sort of found myself doing this quite quickly. So I've got a process. I start with that and then that gives me my tools to communicate. And then I so even though every single project is different, if I start my way, then I'm good for everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, so I've only I'm getting that better and better at that. I think I always say, people always ask if there's the process or what you do, I think every time is so different and you don't have the historical knowledge of yeah. a certain, you are not an expert, you just learn on the job, on the job every day. So you can't begin a job going, I know exactly what to do. You learn together and with the director. Or mm -hmm. And you're all kind of become, especially with the, all these films which are all period, you're kind of becoming historians in a way, aren't you? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah very much you so. kind of need to know the history to then reject it if yeah. you yeah. want to or embrace it depending. Yeah. What you're mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry we are out of time, but please join me in thanking all our wonderful nominees. Thank you.